We had a couple of families living in the middle of Barry, Harrington Avenue. They were very strong anarchists. And uh, they were very violent people, always trouble. Every Saturday night, there'd be a party and generally ended up in a fist fight, you know? And uh, they were bad men with knives. They did a lot of their talking with their knives. But uh, I was only 9, 10, 11 years old, so I don't remember too good. But uh, of course, like we say, the good people didn't have nothing to do with them. I am an antichrist. I am an anarchist. I know what I want and I know how to get it. And I destroy most of my class. Why has this situation and condition come about in our country? It is because those in high public office have kowtowed to every anarchist group that have roamed the street. Anarchy in the USA is coming sometime, maybe. I give a run time, stop a traffic line. Future dream, shop is clean. First, we must distinguish between the moderate and the radical, between the activist and the anarchist. This is critical. There's a difference between the two, and all of us must recognize it. The activist is seriously dedicated to social change. He knows his change will be difficult, but he believes it must come in a peaceful manner. The anarchist seeks only ruin and destruction, and he rides a tidal wave of terror. Extremists are extremists white, black, or whatever they are. And extremism, and extremism is the midwife of anarchy. By tea for the people and the government? I really don't know. <laughs> I know it's all uh, a big mess. <laughs> What's anarchism? Anarchism is when anyone do, does whatever they want without concern for anyone else. What, what, what kind of image does that evoke for you? Chaos. What's anarchism? I would say that uh, it's the, uh, a person trying to push his views down everybody's throat. What do you think? And what do you think? Anarchy, um, yes, I think I'd agree with that. It's uh, a, a dominant view of one person over everyone else. You know, uh, do you know anyone who's an anarchist now? Yes, I do. Who's that? The Ayatollah Khomeini. Another conference, which a friend of mine is organizing in Montpellier. Montpellier. Oh, I was surprised I was able to even sit for one or two of their speeches. He taught a class on God and such. He gave me the Hannah Hawk and Raoul Houseman and some of the John Hartfield and ultra man ray fanatic. Oh, I think it is very very necessary to remain in my country yes, well, and to, and to act in my, in my life. Yeah. Yes, I've thought of it often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what originally attracted me to anarchism, I wasn't attracted, I was uh, conscripted. <laughs> no, I was born into an anarchist family and uh, anarchism was like mother's milk to me, right? Everybody talked about it all the time when I was a child. No, I, I don't think that Marx would ever have uh, uh, converted to other ideas I had. Uh, I he was too he authoritarian for that. Uh, <laughs> I think he was quite set in his ways. <laughs> yes, yes, unfortunately. I think anarchism to most people does mean bomb threat. At the first, but they don't know that it's an idea at all, and a whole, a whole political philosophy, and a moral philosophy. Are you here at the symposium? Are you an anarchist? Am I an anarchist? Um, I have studied all kinds of philosophical and political systems. 
I don't think I'd live up to any of them, but I do believe in personal freedom. And I believe that in order to change anything, you have to change yourself. So I don't know if that's anarchy. Almost anyone, I suppose, could call himself or herself an anarchist. If he or she believed that uh, society could be managed without the state. And by the state, I don't mean uh, the absence of any institutions, the absence of any form of social organization. The state really refers to a professional apparatus of people who are set aside to manage society, to preempt the control of society from the people. So that would include the military, judges, uh, politicians, uh, representatives who are paid for the express purpose of legislating, and an executive body that is also set aside from society. So anarchists generally believe that whether as groups or individuals, people should directly run society. This is a clip from one of our first films, Inciting to Riot. We made it back in 1969 when we were in college and members of Transcendental Students, or TS. Let me ask you a question now. I've heard a lot about TS, and I know that you're not into heavy doctrinaire bullshit like other radical groups. Can you elaborate on, on the politics of TS at all? Yeah, well, like last year we had freakouts and stuff, and that was like taking over the South Study Hall, which was uh, illegal in terms of the university, and just letting people uh, do their own lifestyle thing in South Study Hall, and uh, then the cops were called in to get us out of there. So it's challenging authority, but not like in a really heavy way. It's like creating free space so people can do their thing, and uh, you know, if the cops come, the cops come, and we like we leave, you know, guerrilla style, and uh, go somewhere else. But uh, you know, that kind of thing. We don't try to take people and push them anywhere. We try to create space where they can do their own All right, that's really groovy. Okay, now, if you can make one distinction between TS and SDS, what would you say that, that is? Uh, I guess we're anarchists. Transcendental Students was our introduction to anarchism. At first, it simply meant rebelliousness, anti-authoritarianism, a way of directly confronting the war makers. But as we became increasingly active, our understanding of anarchism changed. And we discovered that anarchism had a colorful past and a legacy that was laced with drama and tension. In Spain, during the Civil War of 1936, three million peasants and workers rallied under the banners of the anarchist organizations, the CNT and the FI, to fight the fascist uprising in Barcelona. Spanish anarchists organized a whole system of production and distribution, substituting barter for money and shop committees instead of bosses or central committees. Anarchist militias went to fight at the front, with soldiers free to come and go as they pleased. Collectives established libraries, free schools, and cultural centers, often in former churches or villas of the wealthy. For three years, anarchism existed in Spain. It was the culmination of nearly a century of agitation and organization that had created movements throughout Europe, Russia, and Latin America. But there's also been a tradition of anarchism in the United States. In fact, there's an interesting theory that says the American temperament reflects many of the qualities that anarchism idealizes. Distrust of government, suspicion of authority, and a belief in the plain old do-it-yourself ethic. So 
So in the summer of 1980, we packed our gear into one of America's own cultural creations, an RV, and set out to explore anarchism in America. show you the shed because it's got that that thing part. <laughs> no, we can, it's our thing, at least temporarily. But somebody might think it's ours and the tax collector would be mm -hmm. here and confiscated immediately. <laughs> that, that, that reminds me, what, what is, what's your relationship with the IRS these days? Miserable. <laughs> Terrible. Why is that? Well, you know, they, they ask every now and then when I'm going to behave myself. I tell them never, and I don't know what they do. You, you're, are you not paying federal taxes? Or yeah, nothing. Nothing. I, don't, I guess I don't take too kindly to them. No, I think, I think well, it's terrible. On the other hand, they're not being very active about it right now. Well, no, the last time was here. It's like they, it's no fun anymore or something. Something like that. <laughs> uh, the, the local people um, seem to take more of a kindly view, as though they really think it's a rotten so sure thing, and that I'm not doing anybody any harm, and that they don't, they seem to be more sensitive, <laughs> or decent somehow, but I don't, I don't know, the federal people, uh, What can they do? Put me in jail. Mm -hmm. Well, I was, uh, I left school when I was 15, uh, and went to work for a radio station, and just stayed in journalism, and eventually, uh, after such places as Newsweek magazine drifted into political writing, or writing for politicians. And I became a ghost writer for, I suppose, all of this part of our uh, century's major Republicans, including uh, Eisenhower, Nixon, Ford. And by 64 was uh, Barry Goldwater's principal speechwriter. After the loss of that election, uh, I ceased to be a Republican by request and became a commercial welder. Well, after, uh, after I got evicted from the Republican Party, I began reading uh, considerably more of the, the works of American anarchists, uh, thanks largely to, uh, to Murray Rothbard, who is a right-wing libertarian, I guess you could say. A free market or laissez-faire capitalist is what he is. But he's very familiar with the, uh, the American anarchists. And I was just amazed. And when, when I read Emma Goldman, it was as though the everything I had hoped that the Republican Party would stand for suddenly came out crystallized in this magnificently clear statement. And another interesting thing about reading Emma Goldman is that you immediately see that consciously or not, she's the source of the best in Ayn Rand. She has the essential points that the Ayn Rand uh, philosophy makes, but without any of this, this sort of crazy solipsism that, that Rand is so fond of, the, the notion that people accomplish everything all in isolation. Uh, Emma what? Goldman understands that there's a social element to, to even science. But she also writes that all of history is a struggle of the individual against the institutions. Which, of course, is what I'd always thought Republicans were saying, and, and so it goes. In other words, there, in the old right, there were a lot of statements that seemed correct, and they appealed to you emotionally, and is why I was a Republican. Isolationist, uh, uh, anti-authoritarian positions. But they're not illuminated by, by anything more than statement. They just are, are good statements. But 
in the writing of the anarchists, the same statements are made, but with this long illumination out of experience, analysis, comparison, it's so, it's rock solid. And uh, so I immediately realized that uh, I'd been stumbling around inventing parts of a tradition that was old and thoughtful and, uh, and already existed. And that's very nice to discover that. I don't feel it's necessary to invent everything. Emma Goldman, the famous anarchist leader, has returned to the United States after an exile of 15 years. I'm delighted to be back in the United States. My hunting ground of 35 years. The country where I had my innings in the social and economic struggle and where I decided to devote myself to the presentation of anarchism as social philosophy which aims at the emancipation economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. Emma Goldman was perhaps the best known of the many immigrant anarchists who had come from countries all over Europe. Italians, Russians, Germans, and Spaniards had been converted to the ideas of anarchism first preached by the Russians Michael Bakunin and Peter Kropotkin. The immigrant anarchists envisioned a world without leaders, a system of mutual aid made up of interlocking federations and communes. The anarchists hoped their persistent educational efforts would pay off when the working classes would spontaneously rise up and overthrow their oppressors. These immigrants created a whole self-contained culture with their own schools, colonies, newspapers, and publications. Together with other immigrant groups, they led anti-war protests during the First World War and were active in fighting the rising tide of fascism during the 1930s and 40s. And they were also the prime targets of government repression, earmarked for wholesale arrests, deportation, and lifelong harassment. What do you think about Russia, Miss Goldman? I consider Russia and America the most interesting countries in the world today. How about Hitler? I don't know him and don't want to. What is your opinion of Italy? Beautiful country minus Mussolini. Ms. Goldman, should the government here object to your uh, speeches of anarchism, would you change them or leave the country? I will leave the country rather than deny my ideas. I prefer to stick to my gun. What is your opinion of Italy? Beautiful country minus Mussolini. Ms. Goldman, should the government here object to your uh, speeches of anarchism, would you change them or leave the country? I will leave the country rather than deny my ideas. I prefer to stick to my gun. Emma answered very well. She was always very sharp. Yeah, but there Emma is... She a, said, I'll stick to my guns. That says it. Tells you everything. Ironically, our exploration of anarchism in the United States took us to Cuernavaca, Mexico. Mexico had become the land of exile for many anarchists. Among them, a remarkable couple, Molly Steimer and her lifelong companion, Senya Fleshin. Like Emma Goldman, her friend and comrade, Molly had emigrated to the United States when she was in her early teens. When I was in Russia and I lived through the pogroms on the Jews, or when I uh, saw the soldiers going to the war, there was war, Russia, Japan. And I saw the soldiers, the peasants, going to war and how the Cossacks treated them as if they were cattle. 
I thought it was because it is Russian Tsarism, brutality of the Tsar. I imagine that in America, the people are better, that the people are finer, they have more sentiment, more understanding of liberty, and would not mistreat one another. But then when, uh, when I saw the persecution in the United States during the war, first it began when we had the meetings against the war, uh, especially the last meeting where Emma and Sasha were arrested. They treated us all, they, they, they went with the sticks as if, uh, well, there was no consideration for the human being whatsoever. Then is when I realized that any government, whether it is Tsarist government, or American democracy, or any liberal regime, those who have power misuse their power against the weaker individual, or the masses who, who are not armed and cannot defend themselves. And I wasn't surprised anymore, no matter what they did. I expected the worst. Emma Goldman once described Molly Steimer as having an iron will and a tender heart. At age 20, Molly was part of a New York anarchist group that published an underground newspaper. In 1918, she and her comrades were arrested for distributing leaflets protesting American intervention in Russia. One of the young anarchists was beaten to death by the police. Molly and the others were convicted of violating the Espionage Act. At the trial, Molly's spirited self-defense made headlines. She declared, individual freedom shall prevail in the full sense of the word. To the fulfillment of this idea, I shall devote all my energy, and if necessary, render my life for it. She was sentenced to 15 years at the federal penitentiary in Jefferson City, Missouri, but she was only to serve a fraction of her term. Finally, in 1923, I was called to the office in Jefferson, Missouri, and told that I am to be deported and that I am to sign these and these papers. I declined. I said, I don't want to be deported. I don't want to be pardoned. You sentenced me. When all political prisoners will be freed, I will be freed. And I went back to my cell. When, uh, I was told that the boys are already in Ellis Island and they are only waiting for me and that I should accept. I did not sign the papers in any event and I said I'm not going to leave because there is a railroad strike. And I'm not going to go on a train that is led by skips. So I was kept for 10 days longer until the strike was finished. When the strike was finished, <laughs> <laughs> they took me, but I never signed my deportation papers. This I never did. Or called them liberation or, or deportation or whatever it was, I never signed them. My anticipation was that I'm going to a country where there is a revolution, but that the revolution took the wrong road because they have a government, a police regime, and that, I will, that the anarchists will have to continue the struggle. But there is a revolution, and I went with a certain enthusiasm because there was an uprising against the oppression. That there will be a struggle, there was no doubt in me. <laughs> The Russian Revolution of 1917 was a spontaneous uprising of peasants and workers. All across Russia, workers organized factory committees, called Soviets, and popular assemblies in the villages. Then the Bolsheviks, headed by Lenin, swiftly and ruthlessly imposed one-party rule. They claimed that the success of the revolution depended upon the people's obedience to the single rule of the leaders. The Cheka, the secret police, suppressed all non-Bolshevik factions, including the Russian anarchists. The great anarchist theoretician, Peter Kropotkin, returned from exile hoping to see his ideas of mutual aid put into practice. He died in 1921, disillusioned with the course of the revolution. Ironically, many imprisoned anarchists were permitted to attend his funeral, 
but it was the death knell for anarchism in Russia, and those lucky enough to escape, like Emma Goldman and Molly Steimer, reluctantly turned their backs on the country of their birth. Years earlier, Michael Bakunin, one of anarchism's leading proponents, warned that the Marxists, instead of abolishing state power, would simply transfer it from one group to another. His words turned out to be prophetic. He said, Marx and his friends will concentrate all the powers of government in strong hands. The red bureaucracy will be the most violent, terrible lie our century has created. My background and how I have become an anarchist is a long, long story. I had entered the communist children's movement, an organization called the Young Pioneers of America, in 1930 in New York City. I was only nine years of age and had gone through the entire 30s as a Stalinist initially and then increasingly as someone who was more and more sympathetic to Trotskyism. And by 1939, after having seen Hitler rise to power, the Austrian Workers' Revolt of 1934, an almost completely forgotten episode in labor history, the Spanish Revolution, by which I mean the so-called Spanish Civil War, I finally became utterly disillusioned with Stalinism and drifted increasingly toward Trotskyism. And by 1945, I finally also became disillusioned with Trotskyism, and I would say now increasingly with Marxism and Leninism. But the essential thing, so far as I'm concerned, as I reflect upon all of this now, is that I had gone through a period of Marxism, which is almost unknown today to many American radicals, a period when Marxism was a workers' movement to a very great extent, and when it, when it was a movement in the streets, in which hundreds of thousands of people at times could be brought out in massive demonstrations throughout the country under red flags, whether it be communist or socialist. And by the end of the Second World War, and particularly by the end of the 1940s, I literally saw this movement disappear, and disappear from history, at least as far as the United States is concerned. And I have no belief whatever that it will come back again. Namely, what I'm saying is, I saw the end of the classical workers' movement. And I had to ask myself, why had this come about? What did this mean? And the conclusion I came to is this, that the workers' movement never really had a revolutionary potential. That the factories, and I had worked in factories for 10 years, and had worked in factories partly as a labor organizer in the old CIO, before it united with the AFL, when it was still in a very militant, you know what I mean, stage of its development. That this workers' movement had never really had the revolutionary potentialities that Marx attributed to it. Then in point of fact, the factory, which is supposed to organize the workers in Marx's language, mobilize them and instill in them the class consciousness that is to stem out of a conflict between wage, labor, and capital, in fact, had created habits of mind in the worker that served to regiment the worker, that served, in fact, to assimilate the worker to the work ethic, to the industrial routine, to hierarchical forms of organization, and that no matter how compellingly Marx had argued that such a movement could have revolutionary consequences, in fact, such a movement could have nothing but a purely adaptive function, an adjunct to the capitalist system itself. And I began to try to explore what were movements and ideologies, if you like, that really were liberatory that really freed people of this hierarchical sensibility and mentality, of this authoritarian outlook, of this complete uh, assimilation by the work ethic. And I now began to turn very consciously toward anarchist views. Because anarchism posed the question not simply of a struggle between classes based upon economic exploitation, Anarchism really was posing a much broader historical question that even goes beyond our industrial civilization. Not just classes, but hierarchy. Hierarchy as it exists in the family. Hierarchy as it exists in the school. Hierarchy as it exists in sexual relationships. Hierarchy as it exists between ethnic groups. Not only class divisions based upon economic exploitation.
And it was concerned not only with economic exploitation, it was concerned with domination. Domination with, which may not even have any economic meaning at all. The domination of women by men in which women are not economically exploited. The domination of ordinary people by bureaucrats, in which you may even have a welfare, so-called socialist type of state. Domination as it exists today in China, even when you're supposed to have a classless society. Domination even as it exists in Russia, where you are supposed to have a classless society. You see. So these are the things that I noted in anarchism, and increasingly I came to the conclusion that if we were to avoid, or if we are to avoid, the mistakes that were made over 100 years of proletarian socialism, if we are to really achieve a liberatory movement, not simply in terms of economic questions, but in terms of every aspect of life, we would have to turn to anarchism because it alone posed the problem, not merely of class domination, but hierarchical domination. And it alone posed the question, not simply of economic exploitation, but exploitation in every sphere of life. And it was that growing awareness that we had to go beyond classes into hierarchy and beyond exploitation into domination that led me into anarchism and to a commitment to an anarchist outlook. How I rule the world today How I corrupt this And absolute power corrupts you Absolutely it can change a man who has a heart of gold, make him cruel, wicked, self-centered and cold. Many men in this land, many organizations, fought for freedom and justice throughout the land. When they have power and authority, they don't give a damn about nobody. Hi, I'm Israel Danish for Yippie Helmet. You know, nature has a special way of protecting artificial and natural things. Here's an egg yolk. Look what nature has protected the egg yolk with. Nothing. Now, nature's real helmet, the natural helmet for the egg, is the calcium-lined calcium cover. Watch as policeman truncheon destroys egg. No good. Nature's helmet for the tomato, a bright red skin, is also valueless when the policeman's truncheon destroys it. Look at this. Squash. Everyone thinks the squash is a powerful and an aesthetic movement of vegetablehood. But yet, policemen's truncheon destroys nature's squash. Eggplant. Eggplant is flexible, but brain damage has occurred inside. Death. Pumpkin. Closest thing to a human head. When this is brought in contact with a policeman's truncheon, watch what happens. And now the yippee head, human's natural helmet contortion. When they have power and authority, they don't give a damn about nobody. They prostitute in the island, milking the land dry. They're making my people starve, exploiting, oppressing, less freedom, more suffering. This thing just can't go on. Think it over, my friend. We're doing a film about anarchism in America. Is there an anarchist influence in the anti-nuke movement? No doubt about it. There's a lot. But, uh, but it's manifested itself not so much in explicit uh, opposition to the state as such, which is the most common form of anarchism, but in a way of operating that isn't centralist, where people who uh, participate in these demonstrations and want to change their lives do so on a participatory basis rather than taking orders from central authorities. That's the way it tends to go. I mean, it's not that that's always successful, but there's that tendency towards decentralism, a tendency towards consensus operation. And at least from my perspective, a tendency to uh, a strong nonviolent perspective, because I think the state is the ultimate violence. And so to see that nuclear power is violent, nuclear power is centralized, and we want to have a certain technology, we want to have another society where centralism of that sort, that authoritarianism is dissolved and uh, is more responsive to people's needs. 
can't block off the road? We can't block off the road. Oh, no, we we're not going to block the road. You don't understand. If we let you drive down there, we're going to have to let everybody else drive down there, too, right? We, can't, I don't know. we can't have a thousand cars down there. You seem to have the power to do what you want. You know? No, we <laughs> do what we're told to do. You're going to take a chance on the cars being towed away. Anarchist forms of organization would be a style of organizing that includes the input and decision making of everyone who is affected, but also anarchist organizing and decision making would involve people taking the, the results of their decisions directly and acting on them, rather than having somebody else do the work for them. But the, it's participatory in decision making and in action and that direct action element, which is embodied within uh, many of the civil disobedience actions in the anti-nuclear movement, such as blocking construction of nuclear power plants. Anarchists have, uh, my understanding of anarchism, has as part of its element a connection between ends and means. To me, uh, if one is an anarchist, then from my point of view, one also must be nonviolent, and if one is nonviolent, one, one must be an anarchist. I, I see the linkage is very clear. A person who is nonviolent is a person, or who believes in nonviolence, is a person who, who believes that uh, the sort of society we want to achieve is a society without violence, without wars, and without injustice. And to use wars, violence, and injustice to achieve that society is to be counterproductive. Yeah. <laughs> Think it's legal for you to talk to the people on the other side of the fence? <laughs> it doesn't matter. They do what they want, legal or not. So do they put the cups on tight? They're pretty tight. Very. Very tight. So how do you feel now that you've gotten arrested, you? Wet. Just now? <laughs> Very wet. Other than wet? Wet. I feel fine. You feel good about it? Well, of course. I feel we're doing the right thing. do it otherwise. The basic problem I really have is that whenever I meet leftists and the socialist and Marxist movements, I'm called the petty bourgeois individualist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to shrink under this. Usually I'm called the petty bourgeois individualist by students and by academicians who've never done a day's work life in their, their entire biography, whereas I have spent years in factories and in trade unions, in foundries and in auto plants. So after I have to swallow the word petty bourgeois, I don't mind the word individualist at all. I believe in individual freedom. It's my primary and complete commitment in individual liberty. That's what it's all about. And that's what socialism was supposed to be about or anarchism was supposed to be about and tragically has been betrayed. And when I normally encounter my so-called colleagues on the left, socialists, Marxists, communists, they tell me that after the revolution they're going to shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> that is said with unusual consistency. <laughs> they're going to stand me and Carl up against the wall and get rid of us real fast. I feel much safer in your company. <laughs> The Libertarian Party is a classical liberal party. And a classical liberal party is believed that people are good, that people can take care of themselves, and that the best way to create a better society is to have smaller government and lower taxes. So we would reduce taxes, we would reduce spending, we would reduce overseas military commitments, and we'd take government completely out of the whole regulation of lifestyles. There's a lot of confusion between the terms anarchist and libertarian. What's the difference between a libertarian and an anarchist? I think if you mean by anarchy, disruption and violence, why the Libertarian Party has nothing to do with it, because we think that our program will create a more peaceful society. Uh, I don't mean in the derogatory use of the term anarchist, but say in the way Murray Bookchin or other left-wing anarchists look at the ideology. Serious anarchist. Is there a difference between that kind of anarchist and a libertarian? 
Well, I think, I think the whole Libertarian Party is aiming toward very major cuts in government, a very much smaller government, and I don't think that as a political movement, uh, Libertarians envision uh, no government as an immediate alternative. Well, it's hard to tell on the basis of the party's rhetoric, because after all, they're running for state office. But my experience is that most people who are in the Libertarian Party uh, have pretty decent anarchist impulses, if they, even if they do not say that they're anarchists. Most of them will say they are libertarians at any rate. And one thing that is useful is that they have a fairly well-refined analysis of why they aren't conservative. It took the uh, new left to do a proper analysis of American liberals, it seems to me, and I suspect that the libertarians are doing the best analysis of American conservatives. I think that they're, they're quite good people and that the, uh, the party contains within it probably more, uh, more people of, of an anarchist tendency than any other organization in the country. Libertarianism has its roots in American individualism. Although American individualism developed independently of European anarchism, both ideologies shared a profound contempt for government. Unlike the European anarchists, the individualists believed that people had the right to own private property, as long as it had been obtained by their own labor. Benjamin Tucker, editor of the prominent anarchist newspaper Liberty, denounced the capitalist monopoly of money, land, and tariff, and advocated peaceful change, not armed revolution. Guided by these individualist principles, Josiah Warren founded two cooperative communities, Utopia in 1844, and modern times in 1851. Many of the 19th century individualists were also advocates of free love. Ezra and Angela Haywood of Massachusetts were outspoken critics of marriage and the subjugation of women. They were harassed and arrested numerous times for publishing and distributing writings on birth control and sexual freedom. Individualism was also at the root of a number of homesteading experiments. One of its key theorists was Ralph Bersodi, who believed the only viable social organization was a society of homesteaders who were self-sustaining and who could live without interference from government. Mildred Loomis, one of Bersodi's associates, became a homesteader in the 1940s. Having grown up on a Nebraska farm, I didn't know anybody was poor or anybody was in need. I was a very naive person when I hit uh, New York City in my graduate work, though I began to be very puzzled by what was called the Great Depression. Remember that? No? I've heard of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, fortunately, <laughs> didn't uh, struggle with that. But then's when I really began to question and to be aware of what I call uh, the legal, the uh, government system. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can understand that when I was young, I had a great dream there on the Nebraska farm that if I were to have what I really wanted, I would be a secretary to what? a congressman in Washington, D.C. <laughs> but by the time I uh, met Ralph Rossotti working there in Dayton, I had question after question to think through. All of this centers around homesteading. Yes. Why is, what principles are there in homesteading that are, that are important? Well, I would say in one word, it's responsibility. I think a person who is responsible and by ethics and by the whole natural setting must be responsible for his own survival. And wherever that is violated by government or business or education or cities or, or anything at all, where responsibility is taken from human beings, we think it's a mistake. Do you see any similarities between what 
what you're trying to do in, in anarchism or the principles Well, of if you mean um, uh, Gilbert Tucker, uh, Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Tucker. Tucker's anarchism, mm -hmm. yes, by all means. Because I, years ago, was thrilled by his way to get rid of the monopoly and the exploitation and get it uh, into a voluntary association. Sure, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm not afraid of the term anarchism, if that's what you mean. That is what we mean. Uh-huh, but you know, if it's one of these bomb-throwing collectivists uh, <laughs> against everything, then we uh, question the use of that term. But for good, straight, voluntary, do-it-yourself, we can handle, we can cope, yes. Great. <laughs> <laughs> an instinctual anarchism in the American people. And it goes back to the, the Jeffersonian tradition. Uh -huh. um, there's a real yearning for self-reliance amongst uh, Vermont, Vermonters, mm -hmm. new and old. I mean, that's what they're up here for, living in these hills. So they appreciate, they're, they're doing it. They may not call it anarchy, anarchism, but they're doing a lot of the things we talk about. Like what kind of things? Um, well, the first was being self-reliant, um, creating alternatives that, that meet your needs rather than accepting what the society as it is when you're born into it. Um, in this little town, it's not a very big town, the people have organized a community center that shows films for adults and for children, that has potluck suppers, um, theatrical performances, meetings there. I see the latent anarchy, the beginnings of anarchy in New England town meetings, in volunteer fire departments, in food cooperatives, that people are responding to a desire to control their own lives, not be told what to do and how to think, and, uh, to be managed and bossed around, but to find ways in which they can take care of their needs, their material and emotional needs within small groups on a small scale where there can be direct democracy and so where people do have a sense of really participating and really controlling their own destinies. What makes this place different from the other well, factories you've worked in? It makes it different because each worker has an opportunity to, to say whatever she likes, she or he likes, to in any of the business part. In uh, our holiday pay, our vacation, or whatever. If we make a loan, that the workers, each individual, each operator has a say. We have to contact everybody. Workers own is different from all other plants I've ever worked because uh, usually the head people, the manager and personnel committee takes care of everything. Right here, the workers take care of everything. That makes a difference. That makes a difference. You build your own business and then you work it like you want to. You know, and you you are, you become a part of it, and it's your business. You're not working for the other man, you're working for yourself. Is there a different sense of community among the workers here than... Well, I think the communication is great. Because they, uh, there isn't another one in this area. And everybody, well, you know, they're, we're just starting, so they are begin to get the feel of it. You know, I think if in another year's time, we'll be... Mm, everybody would be want to have a part at work alone. <laughs> so you really 
You sound strongly committed to the idea. Yes, I am strongly committed to it because I feel as though I'm, it's like working for myself. You know, what I put into it is what I get out of it. Decentralism and self-management are at the heart of the anarchist philosophy. Anarchists pose the question, why should the decisions which affect our lives be made in a remote, centralized seat of government? It doesn't make sense. People should administer their own lives, not relegate responsibility to somebody else. The town meeting, the block association, the factory committee, these are all examples of anarchist types of organizations. One of the things that struck me most when I went to Europe was, and lived there for a couple of years, was how fucking law-abiding the people were and how I broke all the laws. And I think I didn't break the laws so much because I was an anarchist. And I'm, you know, it was just because I was an American. I mean, if I came to a traffic light, nobody was there. I went through the goddamn thing. It was just an attitude, you know. What's the point of staying here, you know? Or if I could get, you know, if I get out on the left-hand side, and, and, and I, f I found that my European neighbors went crazy. Stay in line, you know. It was sort of the constant, like, stay in line, be this way, queue up in England, you know. And I'd say, fuck you, you know. The first one to the bus gets on, you know. And it was this sort of this crazy American attitude that I had, you know. Uh, and I think it was very American that we are a, a people who, who are very smart, you know, that we've got a lot of street smarts. I mean, we know what the law is all about. We know who made it and how it gets enforced. I mean, I think if you stop the average American and say, what's the law all about? Did God make it? You say, oh, bullshit. God didn't have anything to do with it. You know who made it. John D. Rockefeller made it. How can you tell an American? Has he any distinguishing flavor? Could you spot him on an elephant in Turkestan? Floating on a raft 50 miles at sea as you'd know a single leaf from the sassafras tree by its characteristic savor. It isn't that he's short or tall. It isn't that he's round or flat. It isn't that he's civilized or aboriginal, nor the head size of his hat. Just that he hates and eternally despises The policeman on his beat and the judge at his assizes The sheriff with his warrants and the bureaucratic crew For the sole and simple reason that they tell him what to do And he insists on eating, he insists on drinking He insists on reading, he insists on thinking Free of governmental snooping or a governmental plan that's an American. Is this the first rodeo you've been to? No, this is the second time. We just moved to Trekkie last year. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you enjoy it? Uh, it's a great event every year. <laughs> so you plan to come back next year? Obviously, yeah. <laughs> is there something, there's something about the rodeo that you think is uniquely American and it's something that it says about the American character? Uh, independence and uh, individual ruggedness. <laughs> That's probably the, uh, the cowboy, the idea of the cowboy still. Yeah. Let me just get over on the boulevard here a little bit. Just kind of rest there a little bit. We haven't had any chargeable accidents in all my life, and I don't want to run into a neighborhood kid here coming out of school right now or something. I think we're riding in a 1976 uh, Kenworth. It's one of them bicentennial trucks. They came out with uh, this bicentennial truck uh, for our 200th birthday. They made 200 of them. That's the reason for the, the red, white, and blue decoration on it. Basically, the running gear, the transmission, the engine, the rear ends are all, all standard type uh, truck equipment. There's nothing uh, extra super special about it. Just a 350. Yeah, I guess you'd say I'm independent. I don't owe no allegiance to anybody, and uh, whatever the way I can uh, regulate my operation is either make or lose money in the in the whole operation. So in that sense, you're independent, but 
Are there well, other ways in which you're not independent? Well, we're really not independent because you talk about independent truck drivers and then you get into the into the the political bureaucracy that we run out of United States government there in, in Washington, D.C., and the, mainly in the rules and regulations. Uh, I mean, I don't think a man in Washington, D.C. can dictate to me how to operate this truck but they do, don't financially. They? Right. Now, that's what I'm saying. That's why I say we've got educated, smart in Washington, D.C., telling us guys, and, it, and it's hard for me to, to explain to somebody or make anybody understand that if you leave me alone, I'll make a darn good living for myself and put a good piece of equipment on the road, given the opportunity. I'm not out here just uh, using this as, a, as a, an excuse to get from point A to point B or from party to party. I'm out here to, uh, to make a good living, uh, raising four children with it, uh, got a wife, got a decent house there in Colorado Springs. And uh, if the government would leave me alone and back off in some of the rules and regulations, I could do even better. That's, that's what I'm saying. There's a, uh, you know, just because you get let, uh, elected to an office or, or you become a, a political politician, whichever way you want to coin that phrase, don't necessarily make you uh, the big brother that's got to oversee everything that's under your domain. And that's what's happening in Washington, D.C. The people out there feel that uh, they got to be the big brother act, that we're not smart enough down here to do our own thing. One of the things that, w that we're asking people and trying to explore in the film is not just the explicit anarchism of mm -hmm. um, the individuals of Warren and Tucker and Spooner, but but to to, to find out whether there's um, kind of um, an implicit anarchist anarchism in in, in American traditions and American mm -hmm. political history. What's your feeling about that? Well, I think there's an implicit anarchism in any of the American uh, tendencies that have organized people. Uh, in opposition to the state. And I, I think co-ops uh, might have uh, reflected uh, this notion, organizing people not only in opposition to the, to the state, in effect, but uh, uh, in opposition to the major uh, economic uh, uh, movement of the time. Uh, I think, as a matter of fact, just in the, um, the romantic view of the American character, there's a, an anarchist right. tendency. It is flawed by one thing, the abstraction of patriotism. People who will damn the government from morning till night and oppose the state in, in a million and one ways will, at a times of, of, of national crisis, become incredibly patriotic and begin to say they will do anything for the state. And they begin to talk of duty, service, sacrifice, all of the words that are the, the worst words in the world, it seems to me, in, in a human sense, uh, they, they begin talking about. Now, I don't know why this mm -hmm. is, ex unless it is that these are such good-hearted people that they really believe that the American state is totally different from any other state, and it's certainly somewhat different, and that they feel that it is important to preserve. They feel they're preserving the country, but the only language that is available is to preserve the state. I have an idea that one of these days there will be another language in which we can talk about preserving the country, the landscape, the neighborhoods, the people and the communities, without talking about preserving the state. At which point there'll be a lot of radical farmers, factory workers, and, and small town residents in this country. Climbing Milestone Mountain, August 22nd, 1937. For a month now, wandering over the Sierras, a poem had been gathering in my mind. Details of significance and rhythm the way poems do, but still lacking a focus. Last night I remembered the date and it all began to grow together and take on purpose. We sat up late while Denham moved over the zenith and I told Marie all about Boston, how it looked that last terrible week, how hundreds stood weeping impotent in the streets that last midnight. I told her how those hours changed the lives of thousands, how America was forever a different place afterward for, me for many. In the morning we swam in the cold, transparent lake, the blue, damselflies and all the reeds like millions of narrow metallic flowers and I thought of you behind the grill and Dedham Vanzetti saying who would ever have thought we would make this history 
Someday mountains will be named after you in Sacco. They will be here in your name with them when these name, when these days are but a deem remembering of the time when man was wolf to man. I think men will be remembering you a long time, sitting on mountains, many men, a long time, comrade. Oh, ho, psycho, psycho, ho, ho, Niccolo, psycho, ho, ho, psycho, psycho, I just want to sing your name. Psycho, 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 ho, ho, psycho, Nicola, psycho, psycho, I just want to sing your name. Beginning with the First World War, an alliance of the Departments of Justice, Labor, and Immigration initiated a campaign of repression. Agents broke into the homes of suspected radicals, arrested them, and seized their possessions. Many were deported. Most of the victims were foreigners, usually Russians, Italians, and Jews. Two men stand out as targets of the anti-radical campaign. They were Italian-born, residents of Boston for many years, respectable workers, and dedicated anarchists. They were attempting to dispose of some anarchist leaflets when they were arrested on a charge of armed robbery and murder. Their names were Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Oh, Psycho Vanzetti. Oh, Psycho Vanzetti. Psycho, Psycho Vanzetti. I just want to sing your name. The state's evidence was flimsy, and the witnesses for the prosecution gave confused and contradictory testimony. Sacco and Vanzetti proclaimed their innocence, but they were convicted and sentenced to death. Appeal after appeal was denied. The case became an international cause. Marches and defense efforts were organized worldwide. But on August 23, 1927, the state of Massachusetts, which had condemned Sacco and Vanzetti as violent and dangerous men, mobilized 500 heavily armed policemen to suppress protests and electrocuted the two Boston anarchists. si piegheranno fin l'ultimo respiro si ribelleranno ma poi ancora nuovi tiranni sorgeranno finché nel mondo dittatori I am a believer in freedom, but of a special kind. I am an anarchist, and we anarchists believe in freedom from the state, from religion, from all authority. Everybody gets so used to obey some authority or other that they come to think that without the government they cannot live. And when they hear the anarchists saying that you must be the ruler of yourself, you must be the master of yourself, you must be able to organize your own life without the authority of the government, they think that the anarchists are crazy and naturally they get scared getting the notion that without the shepherd to lead the sheep, it would be chaos, confusion, anarchy. You just described the reality, how the state has kind of grown to be this monster. And you've been an anarchist, you deserted the army 64 years old. You just, you mentioned before that you were you know, the last of a generation of yeah. anarchists. Well, what, well, what's your feeling about that? About, I mean, do you feel like you you represent the kind of generation of, of anarchism and radicalism that's gone? Oh no! Anarchism will always be the same. There might be vari variation between one anarchist and the, other, and the other anarchist according to the generation in which they live. But, what about but the principle is there. What the about your generation of anarchists? Well, we are, our generation of, uh, is, are, is almost uh, is all dead, but not the principle. 
the principle that we we we, we had uh, three generations ago is the same. They are the same principle today. Do you see the, people now carrying on? We still, I mean, we want the, the people to be able to rule themselves and uh, the new generation uh, has the same principle. There is no difference between the other one. The only thing that uh, uh, our generation was a generation of, of uh, hungry people, hungry, hungry working people, peasant, hungry uh, worker. Why now today, the, even the working people in the, uh, at least in the industrial uh, cities, in the industrial uh, nation. They live better than the bourgeois of our generation were living. begins with the mind and American minds for generations have been programmed totally the opposite direction well okay we're, the film we're doing at least at this point is called anarchism in America now where do you think um, you fit into this film <laughs> we, um, we fit into this film because we in our own way are trying to um, break down rules like be them not just written laws, but mental laws, social mores, and American attitudes that have slowly turned this into one of the greediest countries in the world. Not to try and over-categorize, over but what are you trying to do you know, with your music? What you... The bottom line, in America at least, is we like to get people to think for themselves. We don't like come out and say, this is our opinion, think like us or it's not cool. No, what we're saying is this is our opinion, judge it for what you will, but for Christ's sakes, have an opinion. <laughs> in this country is going to be very, very hard to make it work. It'll take, like, literally long after we're all dead. believe that one can practice anarchism in this society. I believe it would be utterly illusory to contend, say, that a, a food co-op can replace general, <laughs> you know what I mean, a uh, grand union, or that uh, a so-called people's bank, to use a concept of Proudhon, who is supposed to have been an anarchist, could replace Chase Manhattan. Nor do I think that one can go around living a holier-than-thou ethical life 
you know, that uh, essentially uh, amounts to an ongoing guilt trip against other people. I find that it is basically impossible to live a thoroughly anarchist life within a capitalist society. But I do believe this, that one can try to maintain a high ethical standard. And that is one of the beautiful things about anarchism, that it brings ethics into socialism instead of mere science into socialism, such as Marx does. That one can live an ethical life. One can concern oneself personally with what is humane and what I would prefer to call libertarian behavior. One can protest and one can try to work with projects in which people learn how to take control of their lives, even if, in fact, they can't do so until there are fundamental social changes. Those are the commitments, I believe, that anarchism seriously poses to the individual. And it raises a very high standard. It is demanding in that respect. It demands that you search into what is a humanistic sensibility and what is a humanistic ethic. The ideas of anarchism have always been part of the history of the United States. And anarchism survives because it confronts the crucial dilemma of society, the question of authority and the relationship of the individual to the state. Anarchism alone, among political and social ideologies, opposes not just the authority of the state, of the military, of labor and religious leadership. It opposes the idea of authority itself. How I rules the world today How I corrupts they say And absolute power corrupts you Absolutely It can change a man who has a heart of gold Make him cruel, wicked, self-centered and cold Many men in this land, many organizations Fought for freedom and justice throughout the land when they have power and authority, they don't give a damn about nobody. Prostituting the island to all and sundry, they peddling my people's right. Exploiting, oppressing, less freedom, more suffering. I wonder, I wonder how we survive. Take it over, my friend. Take it over again. Take it over, don't vex with me, shorty. Take it over, I'm singing as a sea. Oh, we can't even buy. Murder the price too high. Malnutrition killing the children while we the adults starve. Yes, the price is rising without control. Young man begging bread by the side of the Prostituting the island, milking the land dry, they're making my people stop. Exploiting, oppressing, less freedom, more suffering. This thing just can't go on. Take it over, my friend. Take it over, carefully again. again. Take it over, don't vex with me, shorty. Take it over, I'm singing as a sea. Work we can't even find Life seems a waste of time Nothing to do but sit around the corner line Don't frustrate it, some would rather stop than beg Others turn to crime and steal what they can get And the judges have no sympathy, they hammer in everyone that they catch Even little children are jailed without regret Lock me up.
up when they catch me Smoking little tampy while the social rich are free Exploiting oppressing less freedom or suffering A poor man's life is really hard indeed Take it over, uh-huh. my friend Take it over, again, again. Do it again. again. says, well, they still have their annual banquet and tiptoe in on Broadway. You go up there, have some chicken and green peas and chicken soup. That sounds good to me. So I went to the tiptoe in that year, 1963. I felt a little awkward because here I was, a square-looking fellow wearing a suit and a tie with a briefcase, looking like any other FBI agent, perhaps. How will they trust me? Would they talk to me? Yeah, these were militants, revolutionaries. What sort of people are there? And I entered this room where they were making speeches and there were songs and they saw me come in. And I was absolutely enthralled by these people. And 15 years later, my opinion hasn't changed. Not one whit. I'm a man of peace and that's why I'm an anarchist may sound very, very contradictory. But this is the fact. Anarchism is a peace movement. I think my ideas were all my life. It wasn't that I had to read about it. But I, I was naturally believing in freedom and not to impose and not to dictate anybody. Everybody was molding a little bit, the, the younger generation, and that's how we came with that. I was never a communist, and I was never anything else but an anarchist. Oh, Alice Island, du Grenets von Freiland, wie grausam, wie schrecklich du bist. who had come out of Eastern Europe or who were still living in, in Europe were not only a religious group, but were a nation. And uh, they were treated as a nationality group with a lot of prejudice against them, but treated as a, as a nationality group. And uh, the Jews, like Frenchmen or Germans or Italians or Spaniards, uh, were, became anarchists, a certain number of them did, so that they were known as Jewish anarchists, just as there are Spanish anarchists or Italian anarchists, but not because they were religious anarchists. I come from a Hasidic family, and I was a believer in, in the Jewish religion, in the very strict Orthodox religion. But I had my doubts, apparently, since my early childhood. And when I uh, uh, finally freed myself of the religious dogma, I still remain a Jew. I still consider myself as a Jew, but a secular Jew. And uh, I consider myself an anarchist because I believe in the uh, attainability of a, a system of society without government. Anarchism in the 1880s and 1890s is probably the largest radical movement among the Jewish immigrants. 
these immigrants actually were upset by the world that confronted them when they arrived in the United States. They were disappointed. For some, of course, it's a legendary streets paved with gold, which they failed to find. I don't think any of the anarchist working men were anticipating anything like that. But they could not foresee the wrenching experience that they underwent from one world to the other. Oscar Handlin, the Harvard historian, wrote a famous book called The Uprooted. And they were uprooted from one land, one culture, one world, and cast into another world where conditions of labor were, if anything, worse than they had found and more rigorous and more demanding than they had been in the old country. And the sweatshops were no better than the factories in Lodz or Bialystok, for example, from which many of them had come. And they, re they were revolted by the entire ethic of capitalism that they found here in the United States, in New York, in Baltimore, in Boston, Philadelphia, and other large cities where they tended to settle in addition to the Lower East Side. So what they did was to replace this world with a counter world, American culture with a counterculture, and they began to establish their whole anarchist culture, an anarchist milieu. On July the 4th, 1890, they started with the Freie Arbeitsstelle. The paper from its very inception was uh, a, an economic paper, an anarchist paper, spreading the ideas of a society without government, without coercion, without force, without wars. The, the immediate task of forming unions to help to relieve the economic situation of this sweatshop worker, and at the same time helping develop Yiddish culture, Yiddish theater, Yiddish poetry, Yiddish literature. And it went on like this till the end of 1977. After 87 and a half years, the Freie Arbeiterstimme had to cease publication. Now here is the guy that we were waiting for. So this is our secretary. Uh -huh. Let me introduce him first. Okay. Yeah. Why doesn't he come out? Come here! Because, you know, I we... I don't want to be a secretary. No, I'm <laughs> the anarchist, you know, like... Now, wait a minute. We are in a hurry. They may shut off the electricity from now between 3 o'clock. They will. Yeah, anytime. So what okay. purposes are... Okay, here's the secretary of the management committee, managing yeah, committee of the Fire <laughs> Now, aside from this, he is a master, a retired master mariner. He helped us win the first, the Second World War, by convoying help and material and ships to more mines. He also did another thing. Oh, he's got a cigarette. He, 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 no. He also, he also helped break, I mean, break through the British blockade uh, around Palestine and smuggle illegal immigrants, illegal immigrants to Israel. Now tell him. Palestine. There was no Israel there. There was Palestine. Well, actually, we're here filming the closing in the the Fry Arbiter Stimme. So what, we were talking about his early days. I was wondering what's the circulation now as compared to when I the first I don't know exactly what the circulation is. Don't you read the Fry Arbiter Stimme? It's 1700. The last yeah. circulation was 1700. Yeah. By the way, you have these points there in the... Oh, you want it here. Yeah, it's 1700. But it was not sufficient enough because we only charged $7 a year. And the, the expenses for printing and mailing are twice as much. And we couldn't charge more because many of our readers couldn't afford to pay more. So this is the reason My why... My observation is this, you know. There was all kinds of libertarian... Uh, there were anarchist publications, Italian, Spanish, uh, other languages. But they gave up, you know. They gave up the ship. The Jews are a stubborn lot, you know. See, so they kept it going, you know, and our family the language is passing away, so they have. That's, that's my observation. I think I'm right. It's a sad day for you? Huh? It's a sad day for you, the closing? It's not a sad day, you know. It, you look at all these books, you know, how idealistic they were to put the books out. The gospel, what you might call, you know. And uh, it's a different age you live in. You think? Are those ideas still, I mean, still important to you? Do you, do you think the they're as realistic are, the, as when you... The idea, th those ideas have been going on God knows how long, you know. Don't, don't, uh, don't take me that I say God knows that I believe there is a big boss with long beard and side locks, you know. What do you want from me? Don't, don't walk because she has to walk away from you. <laughs> but 
Are you still as idealistic as you were when you first read the Fry Arbitration? You have to be idealistic, otherwise you might as well take a gun and blow your brains out, you know. Nicht such mich wut im Erdengrünen, du findest mich dort nicht, mein Schatz. Die Lebenswelten bei Maschinen, dort ist ein Ruheplatz, dort Such mir Ruh, die Fegel singen, gefinst mir dort nicht, mein Schatz. Als klaff bin ich, wie Ketten klingen, dort nicht, mein Ruheplatz, dort He was ready to go, and in the last minute he says, I don't feel well. And Paul Average is going to be here before one o'clock. He couldn't make it earlier. So we'll have to wait a little for him. The Jewish anarchist, besides uh, starting the, the Fire Abertischnimmer, were very much interested in other things. They were very much for cooperatives for building cooperatives, for the unions. They were very active in the unions. The first anarchists that I believe were uh, leaders of the uh, of the leaders. As a matter of fact, we had uh, even one that was the president who was uh, of the um, ILGWU who was an anarchist. And therefore we were able to exist because we were interested in the labor unions, we were interested in cooperatives, and we were very active there. And we expressing ourselves in the Freie Arbeitsstimme was our paper that we could propagate with it. That's what the, the important thing is, why. And naturally, if I could sell the paper, it was propaganda. My early youth, I hung on the fringe of the communists, and when I saw a few of their deals personally, I, I said, not for me. And then through another friend, I came to these people and I was with them all the time, ever since, and that was in my 20s. I've been with them a good 50 years. Their philosophy, their thinking, their dealing one with the other, their concern for each other. It's at least a little thread of humanity, not for the purpose of what's dictated from above. Anarchism is a philosophy which rejects all forms of government. It's the only radical movement, communism, socialism, although the communists and socialists ultimately also reject government, but it's the only radical movement which wants to get rid of the government right now. Freedom now is an anarchistic slogan, to abolish the state. The anarchists see the state and the church as the twin evils of oppression in modern society. In addition to opposing the state and wanting to abolish or do away with the state, all anarchists believe in a decentralized form of society. They saw the great trends of the 1920th century seem to be, at least superficially, towards more and more centralization, great hierarchies, where the individual was losing his, his sense of individuality and his power to the state, both economic and political. Well, the anarchists were individualists, they were federalists in advocating a loose-knit, decentralized society, they were anti-statists, they were anti-militarists, passionately against warfare, preaching love and brotherhood rather than hatred and war. 
Well, most of the people who founded the Freie Arbeiterstimmung were active in the Freie Arbeiterstimmung and supported it continuously until the very end, were people of the needle trades. The same people who were also active in organizing the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers' Union, the Millinery Workers, the Pocket work Workers, the uh, uh, Fourier Workers, they were all people that worked with the needle. The general struggle was to make a union shop and to make union hours. Now we worked, when I came up to the shop, we worked Saturdays and we worked uh, uh, nine hours a day. We uh, worked very hard, you know, it wasn't as freedom as uh, it is later on. But the anarchists didn't like their behavior, their action in the union. They wanted more freedom in the union. They wanted that they uh, should elect people from the shops. And uh, naturally it was as usual, I don't know whether you're acquainted with unions, but there's a machine and they elect whomever is, uh, that they feel like. We happened to get in because we were very active and the workers voted for us. I think they made a constructive contribution to the to the uh, union, especially in the beginning, where it was uh, a question of a good deal of uh, self-sacrifice. I think they, uh, many of the, uh, the radicals, you know, were in those days were ready to sacrifice their time, their energy, their health for the activists in the union. To go out and pick it at any time during the day or night was a, was a duty and a responsibility that was readily accepted and carried out. There was no problem of getting people when it came especially to the anarchists, the socialists and the radicals, you know, to, to go. They showed an example to all the others and were the first ones on the line. doing? What were some of your activities in the, within the movement? 
Well, what shall I say? I started off as a kid, young fella. Got into Syracuse, New York, and a strike broke out. Spontaneously, little falls, New York. And I tell you, comrades, they asked me to go down there and lead the strike. I led the strike down there for several weeks. Surrounded many times by gunmen at night in the halls. That time, pickets didn't have liberties like they had today. And I conducted that strike until Bill Haywood came down from Paris and took over. There I left Chicago. Just prior to that, I'd been involved in a strike of Rochester, New York, the clothing cutters. I lost my job. That's why I had to go to Utica. And Utica involved in the Little Falls strike, so I had to leave there. So I came to Chicago. And I tried to get a job in Chicago and couldn't get a job because the association had to be blacklisted. So I went down to St. Louis and tried to get a job, couldn't get that job. And then I got back to Chicago. I got active then in, in the Amalgamated Union and worked as a clothing cutter. And then during the 1915 strike, I was arrested 39 times. Because, you know, the policeman watches you, and if you hit him with your hands, then he arrests you. So he sh we shouldn't be arrested, so I used to, with my knee. <laughs> the, the policeman said once to the judge, you know, I was arrested when it came to the trial. So the uh, judge asked him, what did you do? He says, Your Honor, she hit me. So he gives a look, and I was standing in the pit. So he says, she hates you. She's so small. He says, Your Honor, she jumped up. <laughs> <laughs> it was true, I slept. <laughs> so naturally, you know, those things happen very often. Because when you go and take down a shop, you get in a fight. But you don't want the policeman to see you because he's arresting you. So you try to do it your way, the way you can. How many times are you arrested? Oh, plenty. But I used to go out from the, you know, the lawyer would bill, bill me out, and I would go back to the big line. I never seen uh, I always would go back because I did things there that arrest you because you start a fight with them. But the way I fought them, they couldn't see it. So they arrest me because I was in the cloud. <laughs> Well, uh, but they didn't see me actually doing it. So you were an agitator. <laughs> well, we all try to do our best. Wie lang wird ihr bleiben, noch 
teaming at that side at that time there were all kinds of uh, activities there were there were the literary cafes where writers Jewish writers used to get together there was the theatrical cafe that was the cafe royale on 12th Street and second Avenue you know where the theatrical people used to get together then there was the cafe where rank and file used to go to like uh, a cafe on, on 2nd Avenue and uh, St. Mark's Place. There was a waiter by the name of Charlie. He was the, the nerve center for all the, the uh, communications, communication nerve center for all the, the messages and uh, whatever we needed, see. We leave word with Charlie. And uh, spend hours, have a cup of coffee there and spend hours, you know, kibitzing and uh, discussing and trying to solve the problems of the world, you see. If we take the trouble to look at what we call the lexicon of Yiddish literature, which is a, an eight or nine volume work, we'll notice that most, the most famous Yiddish writers will have a notation that they started their debuts were in on the pages of the Freie Arbeiterstern. And this was not just a, a coincidence, it was a pattern. It happened. Every budding writer, poet, dramatist, short storyteller knew that if he has any, if he shows any signs of talent, it will be recognized by the then editor Saul Janowski, who had an uncanny feeling to recognize who has in him something and who is just a, uh, a, a dilettante. And he would have in each issue of the Freie Arbeiterstimme a special column where he would answer and he would tell the guys, you better go back to shoemaking or you, back a, you, you become a street, you, your talent shows that you're going to be a good street cleaner something like this. But on the other hand, if he discovers something, he printed it, and he encouraged the fellow. Geiser, geiser, stiller Drimmel, bist kein Heilung für mein Schmerz, bist kein End für euch das Rufen, euch das Suchen von mein Herz. In der Schönheit such ich Sturm, in dem Sturm such ich Ruhe, auf dem Busen von dem Sturm Mach ich meine Augen zu. Giving out leaflets. That's all we knew. There was a man by the name Marcus. I don't know if you heard of him. He was the craziest vegetarian. He only lived on nuts and raisins. That's it. And he was wearing rubber shoes. And he was the craziest anarchist we ever had. He was the one that used to write. But the whole work was, for us, was given that effort. We were going to lectures, there was an awful lot of doings at that time. Labor Temple, 40th Street, was a very busy place. And McGoldman used to lecture there, Boitman used to be there, and whoever was in, uh, Durant, uh, Will, William Durant he used to lecture there, everybody used to lecture there. There was a, a beautiful place, we used Friday night, how did we go to to the lecture. It was never, never a Friday night that we didn't go to hear a lecture. Saturday night we had a dance. But that was when we were in your age. At this point, we don't need a dance. <laughs> I mean, life wasn't all dull for these anarchists. It wasn't all the sweatshop, although many hours of their, their day were spent working. They had their evenings, 
The amazing thing is they had enough energy in the evening to attend lectures. And for the one day that they were free from their, their jobs, they would go on an anarchist picnic. Or they would go to an anarchist dance. The sorts of dance they had were the, the Beurenbau. Beurenbau means the peasant dance, where they would all dress up as peasants and apples would hang from the ceiling and they'd try to bite into them. And they would hold raffles to raise money for the cause. The Arrestantenbeller, the Beurenbeller, these are the arrested balls, the peasant balls, which were held to raise funds for the prisoners under the Tsar. And they sent large sums of money. These working people who would have to save pennies to contribute to the movement and to subscribe to their newspapers would send substantial sums of money to Tsarist Russia uh, through the Anarchist Red Cross. They founded an Anarchist Red Cross in the years before the First World War. So I say it was a whole world. In the 1960s and 1970s, we heard a great deal about the libertarian counterculture, which was counterposed to the American culture of statism, of militarism. Well, this had already evolved in the 1880s, 90s, and in the decades before the First World War. I'd like to welcome all of you to the seventh annual reunion of the Friends of the Ferrer Modern School. We've got a pretty good program set up for this afternoon. This is a reunion of the Ferrer School. It's our seventh one, and about 100 to 200 of us come together every year, and there are very warm refreshments of our memories and of our friendships as we, as we gather this way. No one has lost any interest in, in coming each year. What, what was the Ferrer School? Was it an anarchist experiment or an educational experience? Or? The Ferrer School was an anarchist experimental school inspired by the work that Francisco Ferrer had been doing in Spain until he was martyred. And uh, anarchists in America and in many countries organized such free schools where the children went to school and did not have to do anything that was set out by a teacher, but did the things they wanted to do. The school as it was run, and it was run differently often at different times throughout the years that it was in existence, but the period that I remember, there was a great attempt to keep apart politics and religion and everything else from the school. The school was run by the kids, more or less, with the adults. It was a common, they had a common meeting and, and we ran the school. You didn't have the kind of generation gap which we've seen in, in recent years because there was nobody you were fighting against, in effect. The, the teachers were there and they usually were called by their first name. And um, they were one of us all. You weren't forced to go to classes. You weren't forced to um, uh, have marks or anything else. You could decide what you wanted to do. So that there was no, there was no, the authority came from not only yourself, but the whole student and school community. The idea was that if children were removed from a regimented and demanding society which deformed them and put into a free uh, ambiance, they would develop naturally and they would naturally learn as long as there was any opportunity to learn. Of course, living was learning and learning was something that children naturally did. Most people who have heard of the term anarchism, it's almost a synonym for terrorist. The anarchist is a wild-eyed, wild-haired person with a black cape, with a dagger in one hand, a bomb sputtering already in the other. Well, it is true that there was a terrorist element in the anarchist movement. A small minority, the vast majority of anarchists were very gentle and very idealistic people. And in fact, frowned upon uh, unmotivated terrorism and violence. The socialists would have nothing to do with this sort of thing, and they rejected terrorism altogether, whereas the anarchists tend, uh, tended at least to defend the terrorists, even when they didn't agree with them. Incidentally, I don't want to go to the other extreme to deny that there were any terrorists among the anarchists. What I'm emphasizing is it was a small minority. That is, there were a handful of individuals who carried out terrorist acts, 
a small segment of the movement who supported them, a fairly large segment sympathized with these terrorists whom they saw as uh, avengers and deliverers, you see. People who were uh, doing propaganda not by the word as in the Friday of the Shtima, but by the deed to inspire people to act and to make a revolution. In all the classen whom engaged, Herdman Zabastov guess, Jinglach, Meidach, Kind und Keitsch, wo sind Pumpe Bockes? Jinglach, Meidach, Kind und Keitsch, wo sind Pumpe Bockes? Genug schon wieder Horror, wenn genug schon Morgen leihen. Mach das Zabastov geht, no, mir Brüder sich was freien. Mach das Zabastov geht, no, mir Brüder sich was freien. Brüder und Schwester, no, mit dem Kirchen die Hände. Communist Party started in the United States, it was a terrible blow to the Yiddish anarchists and to the readers of the Freie Arbeiterstimme. What happened is this, just as in Soviet Russia, the communists used anarchist slogans. When, for instance, Lenin promulgated the slogan of the factory to the workers, the land to the peasants, all power to the Soviets. This is pure and simple anarchy. Remember, he never mentioned in all these three slogans, not the state, not the, 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 the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, when, uh, when the anarchists listened to these slogans, they were attracted to them. So here in the United States, just as, way they, uh, as in Russia, anarchists worked with the Bolsheviks at the very beginning. But here, an interesting thing happened. Yanovsky, that clear-headed guy, said the Bolsheviks will never introduce these slogans, and will never practice what they preach. This is just a lie, it's not true, they're not going to give all the power to the... They're not going to give all the power to the Soviets, they're not going to give the factories to the workers, they're not going to give the land to the peasants, Everything will belong to the state. And he was against joining the Bolsheviks, against joining the communists here, and many of the young anarchists, most of the young anarchists, the most active, broke away, broke away from the Yiddish anarchists, broke away from the fire of the Shema and weakened it. And they formed the backbone of the Communist Party in the United States. <laughs> Bring euch a Gries in the trenches. Bring euch a Gries in the boys. They mit mit courage and mit blood. In the Deutsch lachen sie sich euch. Bring euch a Gries in the Sammies. Du siehst der Gries, du so du seid. With the uh, war, a tremendous hysteria seized the country. The atmosphere was terrible. They hated the Germans, so in the city here, you couldn't say, I want a pound of uh, a can of sauerkraut. 
You didn't buy sauerkraut. You bought liberty cabbage. Uh, the mayor, the mayor, a bastard if ever there was one, he said, all red, all signs must not use red, red paint because we don't want them reds around. You wouldn't even have the color. No red was to be in any of the colors or flags or anything in a school or anything else. Mobs, mobs and mobs of people chased the anarchists. The, the, the attorney general was a man named Palmer. And uh, the raids were made against all radical halls and homes of individuals. And uh, they'd get into a place and they'd uh, wreck the office, they'd uh, break the machines. They would arrest uh, people on no charges at all, uh, let them out, then arrest them again. Actually, the, the Palmer raids were the tail end of this. It all begins during the war itself, where the anarchists were, for the most part, what they called internationalists. They refused to take sides in the war. They were against war. They considered it to be a capitalist struggle where the working man was used as cannon fodder for the purposes of imperialism and the spread of their own local interests, business interests. And the anarchists, of course, refused to fight. Many of them were pacifists by conviction. Others would not take up arms for any government. Not only did they refuse to fight, they agitated against conscription. When conscription was introduced in this country, America entered the war in April of 1917. Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman and many of the people associated with the Fayab de Stimme conducted rallies and made speeches trying to discourage people from registering for the draft. And eventually they were prosecuted. Uh, there were several laws that passed during the First World War. Espionage Act was one of them, for example, under which many anarchists and wobblies and militant socialists were tried and eventually convicted, sent to prison, and then ultimately deported. Uh, in one boatload alone on the Buford in December of 1919, um, the cargo contained 250 anarchists who were being shipped back to Russia, including Emma Goldman and Alexander Burton. Well, uh, let's be honest about it. Most of our friends got underground. In other words, the thing became so that everybody was being arrested, and people, if they could possibly get Lay low, they laid low. No question about it. They laid low. Everybody was... In fact, I was arrested during the war at the picnic of the Workers' Institute. That time I made an anti-war speech. I was arrested and thrown into jail. I was in jail from Sunday until Thursday. I was taken for the commissioner Thursday. And the commissioner happened to be a man named Schlottfield, a German who I think his sympathies may have been a little bit the other way. I was taken to the commissioner. He said to me, that was at a picnic? You were drinking? You had a lot of liquor in you? So I said, I was drunk. He said, you wouldn't say it if you're sober, would you? Discharged. Otherwise, I'd been in jail for years. When the raids were over, they began to look for individuals. Apparently, they had my name on the list. But I understood that they were coming to look for people there. That they're not just going to let me go for nothing. So I didn't go home. But they went to my house. And they came into the room. I had a room with people there. And they came in. The people had them in. So they looked over the literature and they saw my books were all on anarchism. And they were looking for something to get to recognize me. But after they, they didn't find anything there. They looked at the wall, they saw a painting hanging. So they asked the people whose painting it is, so they said, that's mine. And they took all that painting and they hung it up in the police station. And 20 years later, I came in with Nelson. We were arrested and brought into that precinct. And Nelson says to me, give a kick. And I looked up and there was my painting hanging. <laughs> 20 years after that. You know, there was a guy named Moses. Oh, Well, he had a brother. And that brother's name was the name of the Aaron? Yes, right. Aaron. 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 Aaron
I have it in Yiddish, you see. That's the way it's spelled in Hebrew. Selma and I did not marry until a few years ago. Why didn't you we, marry? I guess because we were our anarchists and we didn't uh, regard a marriage by either a clerical, either by a clerical group or by the state as necessary for our marriage, for our living together. However, as we reached the age of uh, retirement and social security, I had heard the stories of other anarchists uh, of the great, difficult, great difficulties they had to establish their right to social security uh, when they were not uh, married. And I thought it would be better to avoid this difficulty and get legally married. I went there with my daughter and her children, and my grandchildren were the witnesses to the marriage that we had. Lynn and Gerald were about three or four years younger, or five years younger, and they were our witnesses. Do you remember the marriage we had? Yeah. One of the most important reasons for the decline of the Jewish anarchist movement, and of the, the whole old immigrant movement, uh, which saw its height from 1880 to 1920, was that they were dying out. And uh, the number of Yiddish readers was dying out in general. As I say, anarchism for them was part of their immigrant experience, that their revulsion against America in which they couldn't find a place, a comfortable place. They couldn't speak the language. They were being forced to work for small wages in sweatshops, long hours, and so on, so that they rebelled and reacted against this and became radicals and joined the anarchist movement. But times had changed even there. They were collecting social security checks. They were receiving higher wages. They had bought themselves homes and automobiles, and they were living a pretty much, in many cases, a middle-class existence. And their children were not carrying the torch of anarchism. The children were American-born. They faced none of the problems that the immigrants faced in terms of culture, alienation, language, exploitation, oppression. They lived rather comfortably. They spoke English. They were native-born. They went to school here. In many cases, they became professionals. They went to law school and medical school. They were assimilated very rapidly. Uh, it was very difficult for the old generation to be assimilated. So now you, you have been an anarchist all these years. And what about your, your children or your grandchildren? Are any of them anarchists? No, they, you see, they don't now. For instance, my son, he believes in every tier of the anarchists. But he says he wouldn't belong to any uh, group or any, there's, there is none where he leaves. And so they uh, passed the life away without uh, being active. He would come, he used to come to the fire. I if he do something, he would help out, but he, uh, none of them. Do you feel that they're really missing something important? Personally, yes, I would like them to. But you see, anarchist movement is not the movement that you have a say, or uh, like the communists, you impose things of uh, your ideas. We don't. We can talk to them, uh, agitate it, but we don't impose. So you do as you please. And the same thing was with the kids. They know that I'm an anarchist and they uh, really respect me and everything. And they'll go with me when I'll ask them, uh, they'll give me money when I need for the movement. But they themselves, uh, he says, I don't want to call myself an anarchist because I'm not doing anything. Well, my grandfather was Joseph Cohen. He was uh, an anarchist leader, and as much as an anarchist can have a leader. And he was, about 50 years ago, he was the editor of the Fry Arbiter Stima for several years. And uh, I guess he's the person in our family, in my family's history, that I know the most about. Uh, everyone in the family has always been very proud of him and what he did. And so my father's always been uh, taking great pains to explain to me what an anarchist was from the time when I was a very little boy. Your grandfather was an anarchist. He was a philosophical anarchist. He believed uh, that people should live together in peace and he didn't throw bombs. And that's always irritated my father tremendously, that people thought that all anarchists were bomb throwers and never bothered to learn what the ideas of Kropotkin or uh, any of the other anarchists were. A world wo keiner wird nit regieren über dem anderen's Arbeit und mi. Frei wird sein jedes Herz und Gehirn. 
das ist Anarchie. Eine Welt, wo Freiheit wird jeden beglicken, dem Schwachen und Starken, dem Er und Sie. Wo deins und meins wird keinem nicht dritten, das ist Anarchie. Look at me. Look at me. Do you recognize? Oh, yes. What is she good looking in those years? Yes, this is Molly Steimer, right? Yeah. 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 Molly and Fanny Wessler. Peasant, peasant. That's the only picture yes. so, uh, Molly has of me. That's yeah. I think, uh... How does your anarchism apply to your life today? Well, today, very, very little. But it is this small group, and I'm sure, in case of need, one for the other. We wouldn't hesitate or stop at, at any time. That's within what Kropotkin our, called mutual aid. And within our means of physically and financially. And we've been doing it. So anarchism is, is not just a theory. It's something that you have to, you right. have to apply it as an right. ethic. It's I an ethic know, that you I know personally, I yeah. can say, and I really lived anarchism. And I feel that anarchism, you have to live, not only preach it and talk about it, you have to give an example of yourself. You know, when two Jews get together, there's always a third question, three questions. And the same with the anarchists. Uh, law and order among ourselves could be better, better organized. Uh, but uh, the, the worth sentiments of each other, you don't get it. At least I didn't get it in all my years anywhere else. Henry Gibson, 1870, writing a letter to Gorg Brandes said, Tie yourself to a star and sail with it. Every person must have a star, an ideal, to which he clings. The ideal may not be realized today or tomorrow, but you must have an ideal which will carry you forward in life, will inspire you to do deeds and acts. We are living in a society, may pro we have made economic progress, we may have made here some slight progress, but ultimately, we are living a society with our slaves, poverty, misunderstanding, social injustice, all the wrongs of society. And there are people like, foolish like myself and many others, call ourselves anarchists, who feel that this injustice can be done away with, that people can be educated. We must in our soul believe that justice must prevail. We must have that concept that we are going to carry on, little by little. If the, you see, the trouble is, when you get people into a movement and they see the revolution in, in over tomorrow, and it doesn't come tomorrow, they become dissolution. They were never revolutionaries. They never had a concept, a true understanding. If the understanding, no matter what happens, you will carry on that ideal. You feel that justice must prevail. The, the concept of justice, moral certainty, that right is right, it is the doctrine that no matter what you call it, anarchist syndicalist, anarchist individualist, anarchist communist, whatever label you put to it, what is the ultimate goal of all these scattered ideas? Whether it's the idea of Proudhon, whether it's Kropotkin, whether it's, it's Malatesta or anyone else, each one had little variations. But the ultimate ideal, the ultimate concept of all of these people was ultimate human justice for everybody. And that is the ideal that anarchism stands for. Wer schreckt sich unhoch Meure, will mit uns in Kampf nicht gehen. Jener ist a schlaffke Boy, jener ist a schlaffke Boy, und 